so here we go we are live now on on fb okay wonderful so shall we start now thank you everybody for waiting we are going to start now and i'm going to ask fazia to first start okay thank you amit thank you swati so before um we start today's event which is um a part of our visual art focused event series online event series and the topic is stolen art and detective work before i introduce our speaker let allow me to introduce myself and talk very briefly about samanve um, this organization through which we are hosting all these online events so my name is fazia farooqi i am a faculty member at princeton university i teach south asian studies courses there and here i am welcoming you all on the behalf of the team of samanwe space so what is samanwe samanwe is an a cultural organization a non profit cultural organization dedicated to the preservation promotion and appreciation of indian performing arts and literature both locally and globally we organize regular cultural and literary, lit, uh, literary events showcasing world class indian talents as well as supporting local and upcoming talents through our platform we are very keen to engage with the youth we engage with youth uh, through various um, youth groups uh, youth based organizations and we involve them in organizing and promoting our events we also contextualize performances and events and provide an orientation to various literary and cultural traditions with the goal of Uh, creating or, uh, active audience communities in india and last but not least we strategically work and plan our events uh, to create a space where artists audience um, uh, collaborators sponsors various stakeholders come together to promote um indian arts literature and build a community that appreciate um art and culture and now um today's event i for the for today's event i would like to uh, introduce our speaker our very um well recognized speaker who does not need an introduction but as the tradition is um so um i must introduce her so today's um for today's event we have dr swati desai who is a professional psychotherapist a trained teacher of mindfulness and an art enthusiast she has taught mindfulness and related subjects across universities in the united states and asia she currently teaches mindfulness workshops at the indian school of business in india as well as at various counseling centers in india She worked as a director of campus relations for the Center of Mindfulness at the University of California at San Diego. She launched her own mindfulness app to meditate to promote global groups of mindfulness meditators. She has practiced as a psychotherapist. She has also extensively written on the subject for Huffington Post. positively positive and the times of india and many more publishing platforms she is also an art enthusiast following her mother's footsteps she um from her childhood she has been uh, working uh, with visual art appreciating visual art and she is also very interested in the art history and um for her passion for art history um yeah, her passion for art history is evident in this talk that she is going to talk about um you know stolen indian art and will do some detective work for us to uh make us understand what goes behind the scene so there you go swati welcome to samanwe and uh, welcome to um you know you we are very very looking forward 
to your talk. And before I let you speak, one last thing about you that I, um, Swati Desai, Dr. Swati Desai is also a member of Samanwe's advisory board. And we cannot take a single step without her advice. So we bug her since you know morning till evening. So we are doing everything under her guidance. So Swati, wow. there you go. Wow, wow, it's good, it's good to know. It's good to know, Fazia, you're not taking any steps without my knowledge. <laughs> but that was a very, very kind introduction. Uh, like you said, yes, my mother is an artist, so is my sister who lives in Los Angeles, as well as my other sister who helped me to prepare this talk to a certain degree. I'm not an art historian or an art scholar, but I'm an art enthusiast. And I love to know about these kinds of things and stolen art because we can also have some psychological insights when we are talking about stolen arts, especially from India. Um, however, before we begin, uh, what I'm going to do is I would like to um, do this. Irfan Khan, uh, who was a trailblazer in Bollywood. Uh, many of you know that I'm also very interested in art films. And so Irfan Khan's work is very, very familiar. Uh, I'm very sad to have the news coming today that he passed away. Many of you must already know that. So I just thought that we will uh, send his family prayers and as well as just remember him for a few seconds before I begin. I remember his film Pan Singh Tomar, which I saw in a festival. Uh, it won him national award and he has had many, many, many very well-known films since that time. So this is the plan of action for today. Uh, by the way, thank you everybody for uh, showing up and patiently waiting till we were figuring out our technical difficulties, uh, but that's the way it is. And uh, I just want to do a little bit of housekeeping. We are on FB Live and we are also on Zoom and any questions or comments you have, please type them on Zoom or FB Live. We will be monitoring them and I, and I will be answering those questions as much as I can. We are looking forward to your participation. Um, that's very, very important because I want to generate discussion about some of these subjects that I'm going to talk about. So today let's first talk about numbers because numbers don't lie. And uh, speaking of stolen Indian art, uh, as I said, first numbers, then I'm going to talk about detective stories then we will talk about how, who, why, psychology, and all these things. And then I have some questions for you. And please hang on till the questions, because I'm going to ask you a few things. And the one who comes up with the most creative idea is going to get a surprise gift from me. So that is an incentive to wait till I ask my questions to you. <laughs> OK, so numbers. So why are we talking about this subject to begin with? So our theft. First of all, just world our market itself is 50 billion USD. Out of that four to six billion USD is in stolen arts. 50,000 pieces are stolen every year. And that's a very big number. The question is why is this particular art market, the stolen art market so big? After drugs and guns, art theft is the biggest criminal enterprise in the world. Can you believe that? Art thieves prefer sculptures over paintings, which is good for Indian art because a lot of it is in the form of sculptures. Good or bad, I don't know, uh, because these are thieves preferring this art. Then can you guess which country today is the country with most stolen artifacts? I'm not, it's not India. I think you may be thinking that it's India because I'm gonna talk about Indian art. No, it is Iraq. And the reason being uh, ISIS was, using stolen artifacts from Iraq, from its own heritage, to sell it in the market to finance their, uh, whatever you want to call it, their war. And it used to be almost 1 million USD every day. That was what was reported. 
so in any case what about indian art market currently when it when you're thinking about stolen indian artwork thousand pieces every year are stolen from india currently i'm talking about after independence operation hidden idol in the us by us homeland security is revealed 26 objects were looted by only one art dealer infamous art dealer called subhash kapoor worth 100 million which is 600 crores of indian rupees so it's a huge amount by one person who was in fact running an art gallery called art of the past in new york and manhattan and we'll get to uh, uh, stories about him a little bit later but before i get to the detective story okay so now actually i'm going to get into detective stories i want to show you this image okay okay you see there are these three natarajas so can you tell me what is common about three natarajas other than the fact that they're all natarajas all right so look at them i'll tell you what is common about all of them one thing is of course they were stolen otherwise why would they be here in this presentation so yeah they were stolen they all have come back to india they're all bronze they're all from about 10th to 11th century india from chola empire that was a big empire in india around that time and they were stolen after independence in the modern india from the temples and somehow they made their way to some other western country in the galleries or in the collection so that is the common part about them let me show you the first one it's called london nataraja that's an interesting name right it's well known as Nat london nataraja so london nataraja actually was buried during invasions within india at that time the hindu temples buried their uh, uh, deities and in modern times, I believe it was in the 70s or 80s, uh, one laborer who was digging to build a cow shed found this particular Nataraja. And instead of giving it back to the authorities, he sold it for 500 rupees, which at that time, maybe it was slightly bigger than what it seems like to us today. But even then, it wasn't such a big amount, right? And then that particular person who bought it, sold it to the art dealer in Chennai. And eventually a company in Canada ended up buying, officially buying, because the provenance or the papers that were made for this Natraja, they were forged. And so this person from the company who bought it, the Canadian company who bought it, they thought they were buying just standard regular items. Uh, uh, Natraja. And then they kept it in the British Museum for them to maintain it. They wanted to clean it up and all that. British Museum informed the authorities. Then the authorities came and checked it and decided that probably it was stolen. Eventually, Indian government got involved and there was a big long fight between the Indian government lawyers as well as lawyers from the Canadian company, which were very reluctant to give it back because according to them, they had officially bought it. And you know how they, in the end, how they established that it was indeed coming from India and was stolen. So you see the base of this particular deity. So at the base, they found some termites and that those termites decided that, I guess those termites were from India. And so they decided that this was indeed stolen. And then eventually it was returned back to India. So that is the story of this famous London Nataraja. Uh, then there is this other Nataraja that one in fact was Los Angeles, the place where I was until last year for many, many years, over 30 years. Norton Simon Museum in Los Angeles is a beautiful, not very big museum, has a beautiful South Asian uh, hall. It also has a very famous Dega collection of dancers. And uh, there, this particular Nataraja was sitting there and until it was decided that it was stolen. And Norton Simon, the person who owned it, he admitted that in fact, he 
things that most object that came to him in a South Asian or rather Asian art hall were probably stolen. But the papers that they received, they were forged and they showed them as legitimate objects, but these were actually stolen objects. Again, there was this argument, fights, and Norton Simon eventually in 1986 returned it back to India. And I have seen this particular statue in Norton Simon Museum in Los Angeles. Now the third one, okay, Brihadeshwara Nataraja. So that's the other story. So what I'm trying to tell you, all these were buried treasures who somehow they made their way to the West. So Brihadeshwara Nataraja has an interesting story. This Nataraja was in the temple, Brihadeshwara temple, and it was stolen by the Pandit, the Pujari, who actually was supposed to worship it. And it was probably done under the instructions of our dealers. And it was replaced by, by a fake Nataraja. So for many years, people were worshipping a fake Nataraja without knowing the real one actually had made its way to this art dealer in Chennai and eventually to Subhash Kapoor. So there he is. Subhash Kapoor finally got hold of this Nataraja and then he kept it in his gallery in Manhattan. And eventually it was sold to an Australian art gallery, National Gallery of Art in Australia. And eventually again, like other Natrajas, it was revealed that it was stolen and it was returned back. And how did they find out? So there is an organization called Indian Pride Project. This is an interesting organization. These are people from Singapore. They are not artists. They are art lovers, Vijay Kumar and Anurag Saxena. They started India Pride Project. Their whole purpose, they are all volunteers, 250 volunteers. What they do is they look for objects all over the world that could be stolen and they search the lineage and they prove it that this indeed came from some place in India. You have to prove it. You have to prove the whole trail before you can just ask the owner, current owner, to return it back. And that is what they did. And in the end, they found that Subhash Kapoor was the one who was the sort of the art dealer, dealer slash the person who was faking not only this one, but many other artifacts who were selling it to the West. And so this one indeed came back. And in fact, it was returned back by the Canadian Prime Minister when, uh, sorry, not Canadian, Australian uh, Prime Minister, when they visited India, it was brought back. And you can see um, the moment of pride for our Prime Minister who is receiving this Nataraja. Okay, so that's how you know, all these particular objects have all these stories about being buried and then making its way and so how does it happen? But more than that, my question to you right now, to all the audience is this. Do you think this Nataraja is beautiful? And my question to you, do you think this particular Nataraja, which we know is from 10th century and has made all this journey, it was lost heritage, lost history, and now it has come back. But let's say you just find a Nataraja like this sitting in somebody's living room. Maybe something that, I mean, we, we know there's so many of these kinds of statues all over India, right? Or all over the Indians, uh, houses of Indians who live abroad even. So is, it some, is there something special about this particular Nataraja? That's something that is more beautiful than other regular items you see. Okay, so if anybody wants to have any word, or any comment, please let me know. Maybe you have already made some comments. I'm not sure, but I am going to actually, okay, let me see. <laughs> to a circular third is not, somebody saying, uh, but in any case, so this is what I'm going to ask you to do. So I have a friend, he's a filmmaker, and he made a film called Darshana. And the film or the documentary is about art in India, ancient art in India, and how that art is indeed different um, 
than you know like western art and what's different about it so i'm going to i asked him i asked him what he thinks about this particular art being different the ancient art being different than the replicas and this is what he said his name is vikram juchi and uh, i was and he currently is in mexico under lockdown when i was talking to him so let's listen to what he has okay. to say there is a difference between good okay let's let's forget that they are temple deities and if their temple deities the value is on a different sacred level but let's look at them as art objects okay do you think there is a value in them as art objects you know like let's say somebody buys a natraj made 10 years ago in a factory worse is a natraj from 10th century chola period from chennai yeah is there a difference just as an art object you know somebody is evaluating the art history is there something more beautiful about the 10th century object yes obviously because the object that is produced in a factory yeah. is a replica yeah you know is a replica so if if you look at the people who are commissioned to create these objects because i made a documentary about this okay and in fact i spoke to people in nepal and other places yeah who are who are commissioned to produce these objects for private owners you know or whoever and uh, they uh, they are given the diagram and the diagram is from the original object from you know a thousand year uh, you know the original object from the lichavi period or from the gupta period or from whatever period you know so that and based on that then they create this uh, this replica so and if you go to you know uh, pahar ganj in delhi mm -hmm. now you would see you know hundreds of such objects being produced being mass produced mm -hmm. for private homes or for whatever so uh, obviously it's an industry now and um, uh, there is a huge difference because uh, the object that was produced at that time I mean, you can see you know sensuousness and the mm -hmm. and the kind of Uh, you know the artistry that has gone into it mm -hmm. whereas anything that is mass produced is just mass produced because now uh, what you have is like a xerox copy yes yes it so what he's saying this is what i get okay authentic versus replica there is something that we value when it is an authentic i mean one thing is the ancient aspect of this particular object and also the fact that it is authentic if it were just replicated even if it looks the same it's not the same to us and why is that and i have a psychological explanation for this which i would like to talk about so evolutionary psychology basically will say why do we value something that is real versus something that is just an imitation we want authentic honest things why is that so evolutionary psychology is this area where they believe that the way our psychological development has happened is because of the evolution what that means is the standard principles of um uh, natural selection as well as us wanting to survive and spread our genes that is the motivation for our psychological development so the reason we we want the authentic is because look at this generally speaking most human beings they are their own pr agents by that i mean public relations agents the way we conduct ourselves in public is basically to promote ourselves to a certain degree so what is inside what is authentic what is honest that's something we don't know when you just see somebody in public but we need to know that and it's okay in general it doesn't matter but if you want to build a relationship with that person maybe a business relationship or intimate relationship you will be dealing with the authentic person the honest truth behind what they show in public and that is what matters to you right because what we want is the authenticity the uh, i mean if you have uh, if you're do, going to do business and if this person is just bragging or showing off or making stuff up you will be in trouble and so will you be in trouble in intimate relationship so to, so to keep ourselves safe that's one reason why we always seem to value authentic 
in this particular case it's authenticity but also along with it the fact that it is ancient also holds some meaning to us and i would like to talk about what is it that comes from ancient period that seems to hold more meaning to us and also the fact that in case of indian art that we have seen so far these are deities so we have a relationship with these deities so uh, i'm going to talk about that in a minute let me see what i have after that this is a shiva parvati this came from new york and i just want to mention one thing from new york's a uh, famous museum the met the metropolitan museum of new york had close to 200 objects from india they which they returned back because they were all folded and a lot of them were again done by subhash kapoor so speaking of subhash kapoor we are going to get to that figure again soon but what i would like to do is uh, talk about a little bit about archetypes so what these images or these deities or artifacts what they are doing is they are invoking the archetypes what does that mean so psychologist carl jung he came up with this theory of unconscious so our mind like freud said part of it is conscious and part of it is unconscious so what is hidden in unconscious we don't know and part of unconscious jung said is from collective unconscious depending upon our race or depending on depending upon the culture we are born we have collective unconscious like something that we share with everybody around us okay and so from the collective unconscious sometimes we also hold in the collective unconscious we also hold archetypes so these are universal symbols that we hold so we are not consciously aware of it but they get triggered or they get invoked when we see something in our environment for example um examples of archetypes are let's say mother figure or hero figure uh, or or figure as in uh, that idea so mother for example in our archetypal image of a mother a mother is a protector a mother is a guide mother will do anything to save the children maybe that's the archetype that we have especially within indian context right so when we see a goddess maybe that archetype will be triggered now what goddess will trigger archetype uh, of mother for you will depend on your environment how you are raised a western person may not have the same reaction when they see a goddess maybe for them if they see a madonna and a child then that mother archetype may be invoked so the point is that when we look at these images and if you have a strong reaction to it maybe some archetype something from your unconscious is getting invoked so next time when you feel strongly when you look at an object think about what from your unconscious is getting invoked what is it telling you about you like when i look at this shiva parvati what's getting triggered in my mind i see a family i see mother father and a child i don't know if that's what it's supposed to mean but that is the archetype of a family and for me it, this family is not very intimate they are kind of sitting apart from each other and following certain roles certain gender roles and that may be coming from my modern uh, gender based uh, you know like thinking so anyway so so just next time think about your archetypes when you think about when you see it, look, look at an artifact or a, an image or an art and this happens with paintings too this is not only about indian art this is true of western art as well so i want to before i move on to the next part of my talk i would like to actually say that the thefts are happening even now so a lot of us we live in hyderabad Did you guys know that from Nizam Museum there was a heist on September third, two thousand eighteen, and this museum holds a lot of Islamic art, and there were these two objects of gold objects, real gold objects, and the two thieves they were just regular labor like a welder and someone else, and they had worked in Saudi Arabia, so they knew that these objects hold some value, so they. 
what they did was they went on the rooftop there was a ventilator they plugged that ventilator and from there they descended in and while they were descending in they turned the cctv camera so they will, would not be seen they came in they just, just didn't they just had pliers and things like that not even a glass cutter nothing advanced and they just broke the glass they took these two objects there was also quran next to it but apparently as they were going to take the quran they heard the prayer on the mic and they decided uh, that the guilt was invoked and they decided not to steal the quran and how do we know that i'm coming to that in a minute so these two objects they stole, they ran away, they took inside roads to reach uh, a village close to Hyderabad. But in this particular case, the Hyderabad police, and I have to give them credit, they went, they got on this case right away, they made 20 teams, and they were like searching everywhere. These two thieves, they took these objects to Mumbai, and they were trying to sell it, and the police were tipped, and within two weeks, the criminals were nabbed which is unusual because most art theft, by the way, does not get recovered, which is another interesting aspect. So um, look, these are the proud Hyderabad police. And then I would like to also talk about another modern, very modern and interesting art theft within India. And this is not artifact, not deity. This is actually modern Indian paintings. So many of you may know that Air India during the 70s and 80s and so on, they were collecting a lot of art of upcoming artists like M.F. Hussain and Jatin Das before these guys became really big international artists. Air India would commission art, they had a huge art collection. Eventually Air India's mismanagement and Air India's and renovation and what, by the way, all this art was hanging in there lounges on airports as well as in the headquarters but eventually then they decided to all store it in a storage place because of whatever the reasons were and guess what happened this art started getting stolen nobody even knew about it until Jatin Das who is a very well-known international artist he had an inquiry by a curator museum curator asking him do you uh, have you painted uh, like an Apsara painting? I mean, we just want to authenticate this because this is in the art market and we are thinking of buying it. And Jatin Das made more inquiries and said, no, this particular painting belongs to Air India. In fact, they had commissioned me to do that and it was hanging in one of their lounges. And so then the whole inquiry and investigation began and they found out that from their whole collection, which was by the way, 1300, crores worth, out of that 700 crores worth of art has disappeared. It's gone and mostly their employees or maybe other thieves or people like that have stolen it. So imagine Air India is currently in the debt 5,200 crores. If they had their whole art collection intact, maybe they could have recovered 1,300 crores, but they cannot do that anymore. So such is the nature of uh, our thefts. Um, okay, I have, a, I am going to read this particular comment by Arjun. The valuation of art has to do with scarcity, uniqueness of object, something with the aura, less to do with beauty. In modern times, everything is replicated. Therefore, authenticity is valued, usually in the past. Authenticity feels like a commodity itself. So that's an interesting comment. I've already talked about authentic versus uh, replica. Oh, this wasn't Arjun, this was Praveena. Okay, thank you Praveena for that interesting comment. Uh, next time, I hope I get to read it before it's actually, uh, before I'm talking about the next subject. Okay, so again, back to Vikram Zuchi. So this is the reason, okay, now we are done with my detective stories for the time being. And I'm going to get into like why, how, and all that kind of stuff, a little bit of psychology again. So there is a difference between Indian art and Western art. And I was asking Vikram about the film he made called Darshana, and this is what he said. And that 
points to the difference between Western art and uh, the film is about uh, uh, basically uh, when you look at an object like what we were talking about, when you look at these ritual objects in a museum and the people who are looking at them, and then you when you show the same objects in their ritual context right. as to how uh, the relationship between the devotee and that object. So then you redefine the role of art. Yeah. You know, because art as seen in the West is a spectatorial activity. That you know, is. you go and see it and it's art. Ah, sorry. It's trying to increase it. As Indian art and sacred art, Asian art, mm. uh, traditional art is, uh, you know, not driven. It's not a cult of personality. Mm. Uh, you know, it's a, uh, it's about uh, the relationship between uh, the devotee, the worshipper, and the deity, mm. and then uh, what are the, meta the metaphysical meanings of mm. these various artworks? How are they used in ritual worship? Mm. You know, and the, the, what is darshan? What is darshan? You know, when you are having darshan of the of the deity, the mutual uh, gaze yes. between uh, yes. between you and the deity, and then back from the deity. To you. So this is what we discuss in the film. Mm. So you know, we uh, we went to the museum. We shot the object in the museum. Mm. Then we went to uh, India or Nepal, and we went to the community that mm. produces these types of objects. Mm -hmm. And then show the actual ritual um, application, you know, the, uh, the ritual practices of these. So these the three the three uh, sort of links. Okay, so, so that's how Western art and Eastern art is different. Uh, now, the question is, how did Indian art start going to the West? Most of the stolen Indian art has gone to the West. And there are three different ways that in which it has gone from here to there. One is colonial times. The objects that I showed you so far, they were all from modern times, they were post-independence. But before that, during colonial time, a lot of art, artifacts, archaeological treasures, they went to, uh, went to the West. And I have an art historian scholar who is a professor in Northern California at California Institute of Inter Integral Studies. And I was talking to him about it. And this is what he has to say. His name is Debashish Banerjee, Professor Debashish Banerjee. He is literally a walking encyclopedia of anything to do with Asian art, philosophy. I have utmost respect for him. So I'm very happy I got to talk to him about it. So let's see what he has to say. I hope the volume because is- Because ultimately it goes back to the colonial. Uh -huh. And you see, nationalism, Indian nationalism developed at that time. So you had figures like Kumaraswamy, who was actually, Kumaraswamy is a really interesting figure because he's partly Western and partly Indian. His father was, was Sri Lankan and his mother was English. He grew up in London and he was part of the arts and crafts movement. So he was part of the debates about, he saw from childhood the debates about Western art and Indian art and all that. And at that time, no, nothing that we are calling art in India was considered art in the West. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's a, one of the, uh, one of my mentors, you know, Arthur Mitter, uh -huh. he's written a book called Much Maligned Monsters. It's really a history of the Western view on Indian art. Okay. And up until the 19th century, late 19th century, they thought that Indians were totally barbaric. They produced monsters, many arms and all that. And there was, it was not considered art at all. It was considered grotesque, you know, okay. forms. Okay. And then what happens in the, in the turn of the century is that Kumaraswamy came along and there were some other people as well, some Western people like Havel and others, they were part of a Western debate on the inclusion of Indian art in the Western Museum. And they said, yeah, it is great art. And so they wrote the books by which they created the lens for looking at Indian art 
as something that could be included within the Western Academy as having aesthetic value. Wow. And today we look at that and we view our art in terms of, you know, the Western way of looking at art. Wow. So that's where it comes from. Yeah, that's where it comes from. To and some extent, it yeah. comes from our own people. Yes, our because own people. Know, yeah. yeah, the ironic thing is that, the, the, see, it's like we aspire to become Western. Because in a way, you think that, you know, if we don't have any validity in the eyes of the West, mm -hmm. then we are second class citizens in the world. So we have to include ourselves in the Western museums. And that's where today all Western museums will have their Natarajas. And yes. that's where the theft is taking place. You know, all these objects are being stolen to ship them to American museums. Yes. At one time, they didn't even consider it art. Today, yeah. it's, it's the whole discourse is, has changed. So that is an interesting fact. I didn't realize that it was uh, not considered art and then that changed because of Kumar Swami's effort. So you are saying in a way we are responsible for it ourselves in yeah. some sense. It's not that Westerners suddenly found that, wow, such beautiful art objects and archaeological treasures, but yeah. they were told to look at it by Kumar Swami and then they suddenly discovered it. So there are yeah. two, two types of things that have happened, I guess, during colonial times times and they took the art they must have been like in the candy store once Kumaraswamy convinced them that it was yeah. really art then it was like being like what they call the live museum right and they could take That's any right. object yeah they could take they could take any object they wanted to uh, to the west right. to, to uk to uk primarily That's and, right. and british museum has these amazing has this amazing collection of amravati marbles yeah and, all these things. Yeah, Swati, actually, that's a very interesting part. Actually, so there's two different fields. There's archaeology yes. and there's art. Yes. So even before, the, you know, people like Kumaraswamy came along, already the notion of Indian antiquity yes. and archaeological, you know, sort of ancient, uh, you know, value, that had already be become very popular. Okay. So what you're saying exactly was happening. So even at the time that Kumaral Swami come, came, we had Karzan. You know, Karzan was the governor general at that time. Yeah. And he was, you know, he created, he's the one who did the division of Bengal. And then there was nationalist period began because of that mm -hmm. in 1905. Mm -hmm. But he was really interested in Indian archaeology. Mm -hmm. He promoted it very much. Yeah. But for the reason that you pointed out, because they thought that India was the living museum yeah. of the West. Yes. So, you know, it was a great touristic preserve and it also bolstered their sense of, you know, ownership that we yeah. own the, the, the greatest archeological products yes. of the world. Yeah. Yeah. So what happened was all these objects going to the British Museum, um, and other places in UK at that time, British Museum has amazing collection of artifacts and archeological treasures from India. And I wanna show you a clip of this one video which someone took illicit, I believe, because I don't think museums allow you to take your camera inside and just take pictures or of whatever you want. And this guy is taking picture of India exhibit or uh, film of India exhibit in the British Museum. So let's have a look at it. And I really want you to see how beautiful these objects are, what he's trying to show. You're going to see one of the most remarkable exhibits you have ever seen in any of the museums you have visited. Let's go through this door and you'll find out what I'm referring to. Come on. Wow, look at Let's, this. Let's uh, start our tour of the India exhibit here at the British Museum by looking at one of the most remarkable exhibits in the whole museum, in the whole of British Museum here in London. And this is Amaravati. Amaravati. These are remains of a temple a stupa that was created in 200 AD in southeastern India. 
and the parts of the temple of the stupa have been removed from the temple right here in England, in London, priceless. This actually gives me shivers. 200 AD, I guess some archetype is getting invoked. I'm not sure which one it is. However, look at the artistry. And from 200 AD, and this whole temple was taken and it's housed in the British Museum. By the way, British Museum um, is saying they are, they are not going to return any of this back because they don't believe in the returnism. They don't believe in that. So let's see, I'm going to take you out of here. I'm going to forward this a little bit. And show you some of the other beautiful objects that are here in this same exhibit. Yeah, look at this Nataraja. This must be Bruhadeshwara Nataraja. That, that's what I think. The one that as you guys know, went back to India, thanks to the India Pride project, and it went back to the temple, its original place. And uh, here's the beautiful bronze statue of Tara, the goddess of compassion. Well, certainly one of the most beautiful statues in the India exhibit here at the museum, the British Museum in London. And then comes this another gorgeous piece of Shiva and Parvati. So I think you get an idea of what lies, what treasures. Next time you go to London, and you go to British Museum, I hope you have a different experience of looking at this art. Do, do visit the India exhibit over there, or the, some of these are permanent exhibitions over there. So Lena is saying that the ticket sales from these exhibitions help build most of UK museums. Yeah, I mean, this is amazing art. Okay, now, okay, so, so that's about the colonial past uh, and how the art went to the Western countries. The other way in which it goes out of a country and including India is during war or during some disturbance, art thieves take advantage of it. And I want to show you this one piece, which is actually from the West, the famous painter from Austria called Klimt. He's kind of like an iconic Austrian painter. And this particular painting is Mona Lisa of Austria. This one is called Woman in Gold, or Lady in Gold. And Klimt used actual real gold, gold leaves, to create this painting. And look at, I mean, it's a portrait of a, a woman. And this woman belonged to a rich family. And then during Nazi period, these paintings by Klimt were stolen. And then they entered Austria again, and then it was shown in Austrian museum. I want to tell you the story of this particular painting, which is again, a very interesting modern story of theft, theft and recovery. So this is the news item, Santa Monica, which is part of Los Angeles. So the woman who was the heir of the woman in gold of that family, she found out that in Austria, the painting was sitting there and he, she had to fight a big court battle to get that painting of her aunt back to Los Angeles. And I've seen that painting when it was exhibited in Los Angeles when it came back. So let me just run this. Leslie, thank you. An Austrian court cleared the way today for an LA woman to reclaim family owned art that was seized by the Nazis. The five paintings by Gustav Klimt include a portrait of her aunt. 
Eyewitness News reporter Carlos Granda has a look at her fight to get the family treasures back. Carlos? Well, Ellen, this is a story that dates back 70 years, a story of family portraits that have become treasured works of art worth $150 million. They were taken away, seized by the Nazis during World War II, and now the family can get them back. Maria Altman is surrounded by her family as she holds a copy of Adele by Gustav Klimt. The subject in the painting is her Aunt Adele, and Altman is the rightful heir to the original. I had always hoped that uh, justice would find its way, and it did. Altman has been involved in a legal struggle since 1998 over who owns several of Klimt's paintings. Her family lived in Austria, and the art was seized by the Nazis when they took over in 1938. She never thought she'd see these paintings again. They have been away from me for so many years. I was a very young girl when I left them uh, the last time, but I saw them in the house of my uncle, and ever since then they were buried in, in, in salt mines in, in during the war. Altman's attorney says Austria has a law that requires museums to check all their works of art to see if they include items seized. So I have to give credit to the Austrian government in the end who listened to the U.S. Supreme Court and they returned these paintings back. They were exhibited in Los Angeles because the woman, Maria Altman, Altman is a Los Angeles, she's no more. And the paintings are now hanging in new gallery in New York. So you, if you visit New York, you must see these amazing paintings. I love Klimt, all his other paintings too. Um, so, so Nandini is saying that Arthur Sackler Museum of Asian Art in Washington, DC. That's true. There are so many of these amazing museums. Are these Sacklers the same ones who got their bad name during this opiate, opiate crisis in the US? I think these are the Sacklers. But in any case, so let's move on. Uh, I want to show you a small clip of the movie Woman in Gold. And, and Helen Mirren is talking to uh, the lawyer. Helen Mirren is playing Maria Altman in this movie. Oops. Here she is. My aunt, Adele. My uncle commissioned Gustav Klimt to paint her. It's quite a painting. It's magnificent. She was taken off the walls of our home by the Nazis. And since then, she's been hanging in the Belvedere Gallery in Vienna. Now you'd like to be reunited. Wouldn't that be lovely? Make you a rich woman, I'm sure. Do you think that's what this is about? No, I have to do what I can to keep these memories alive. Because people forget, you see, especially the young. And then, of course, there's justice. And then, of course, there is justice. So that's the reason why she fought this whole, whole uh, court case. Uh, so, okay, and similarly, Mahisha Sura Mardini Durga from Kashmir was stolen from the temple during the 90s when there was a lot of turbulence in Kashmir. And the reason, another reason why I'm bringing this up is guess who was ultimately the art dealer uh, who was housing this Durga? No one other than, none other than Subhash Kapoor in his his Manhattan gallery. And this has an interesting story. Dr. Paul, who is a very well-known art historian, one of the best known art historians of Indian art, he actually saw this in Subhash Kapoor's gallery and he said, I believe this is from Kashmir and are you sure it is legitimate? And that time Subhash Kapoor, he pled ignorance and he said, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll see what I can find out but he did not obviously find out anything because he knew that he himself had forged the documents, the ownership documents. Ultimately, this Durga went to Germany and uh, there in the end, people ended up again, I believe these were the same people, the India Pride Project people who proved that this one was from Kashmir and then it was returned back 
by none other than Angela Merkel, again, to our prime minister. So speaking of Subhash Kapoor, you know how, in fact, he got arrested? So Subhash Kapoor's girlfriend was, in fact, an art dealer in Singapore, a long-term girl girlfriend was an art dealer in Singapore, and she used to help him to forge the documents. She would show that it was owned by her or someone she knew. And eventually their relationship broke up. And then um, they had a court battle to decide which object goes to who, and Subhar Kapoor took most of it. So this woman obviously felt very duped, and she was very mad at Subhash Kapoor. And she started questioning everything else that he owned in the press. She started doing that. Eventually, in the Brooklyn Museum, where she made these inquiries, they went after Subhash Kapoor. By that time, Subhash Kapoor had another girlfriend who used to help him to forge the documents. But eventually, the Brooklyn Museum alerted. When they alerted the authorities in New York, they eventually caught hold of Subhash Kapoor. And so the message is, if you want to do any illicit trade or you want to hold any illegal art object in your home, make sure you don't fight with your girlfriend, never decide to break up with her. And this is not the only time, by the way. There are many stories of this type where a couple, after breaking up or after something happened, one person becomes disillusioned and uh, then somehow their thefts come out in the open. So that's the other, other way in which our thefts gets revealed. So, okay, so now let's go a little bit towards the profile of an art thief, okay? And then the psychology behind art theft and art collection. So we think about art thieves as sophisticated, suave, who understand the value of the art and they have these elaborate schemes to steal the art, like it is shown in the movie, Thomas Crown Affair. Many of you may have seen that movie. If you haven't, tonight is the time you can see it. And I'm gonna show you a clip from that movie right now. This is the Met, the museum, again in New York. That's, what they, that's where this Thomas Crown is there right now. Excuse me. What do you think you're doing? Yes. What? Upstairs, send us down to clear this exhibit. I've got some VIPs coming. I didn't hear about it. I oversee this section. Call upstairs if you like. You're right. They've been having people down here all week. They is stealing the Monet in his briefcase. Look how he's stealing it.
Okay, so this is how Thomas Crown looks like. I have to tell you something. Real art thieves do not look anywhere close to Piers Brunson as handsome, nor are real art thefts as elaborate and as uh, sexy looking as this one is shown. So how do real art thieves look like? Okay. So before we get to that, I want to show you another one that was actually a real art thief. This one, Vincenzo, I hope I'm saying his name correctly, Vincenzo Perugia. If there is any Italian, my friend Gloria, if you are here, uh, please forgive me. He stole, he was a handyman in Louvre. And at that time, Mona Lisa was famous, but not as famous. And as everybody knows, this is Mona Lisa. He stole Mona Lisa and it was sitting in his broom closet for two years. And the reason he said he stole it is because he is an Italian guy. And the painting was hanging in a Parisian museum in Louvre. So he said that this particular piece of work needs to go back to his own country where it belongs because this one was made by Leonardo da Vinci. It is an Italian painter. So uh, eventually when this guy was trying to sell it, eventually he was caught and Mona Lisa went back to its original place. It's a small painting in this big huge museum, but you see that it's most crowded part of Louvre Museum. And in some sense, Vincenzo made Mona Lisa into a famous piece of art, as famous as it is now. So that's the other thing about uh, thieves who steal the art some of them may steal it for reasons of their own, like idiosyncratic reasons of their own. But what is the otherwise typical profile of an art thief and an art collector? Okay, so let's get to the psychology of an art thief and then the psychology of a collector. So art thief, 99% of art theft happens just because of simple profit motive. Because as I showed you in the beginning, there is a lot of money involved and that's the reason. And these are a lot of times, these real thieves, they just go, they are not really using any sophisticated methods. They basically watch the security cameras and the routines and all these kinds of things. And they steal it and they themselves don't make that much money. They sell this piece of art Sometimes they have been asked by gangs to steal it or some art, art uh, gallery or somebody like that buys it from a thief. Thief himself or herself does not make that much money. It's the art gallery, that person then ends up selling it to some museum or some private art, art collector. They are the ones who make, me, make money. They may sell it to an auction house like Christie's and Sotheby's. So what happens is how come museum collectors uh, who are, or museum curators are supposed to be these suave people, how can they not see if something is forged or something is stolen, especially antique art? So the reason is because they choose not to look into the details. They just look at the forged documents. They don't ask that many questions. And because they know that most antiquities and some type of even painting and other type of art is not going to be coming to them by legitimate lineage kind of way, especially Asian art. So they don't ask that many questions. Uh, so they are just part of this whole journey, um, a hidden journey that a piece of art makes from its, piece of, uh, from its place of origin to be shown in some museum. Sometimes it ends up in the collection of a private person. Okay, so 99% of the theft happens by just uh, regular thieves for profit motive. To them, it doesn't matter. It may be a piece of art. It may be going to the bank and robbing a bank. There is no difference. However, 1% of the art thieves are doing it because they love the art because they have a special relationship with that piece of art. Like Vincenzo who stole Mona Lisa is one example, but there are other art, uh, art thieves. There was one most prolific art 
thief called Stefan Bertweiser from France. He has stolen 300 objects, not just painting, but other objects from museums in France, in Belgium, in Switzerland, and so on. Ultimately, he got caught and he was interviewed. You know what he said? He said that he stole it because he wanted to rescue those art pieces from the confinement of a museum. And also he wanted to own them. There is something about ownership of anything that we see beautiful that's very attractive to us. Now, why do thieves who are doing it for profit motive, why do they steal it? Because there is big value in this art. Where does the value come from? It's because museums and collectors want to own it and they want to buy it. Now, what is the psychology of a collector? Again, some collector just may do it for investment purposes, but let's forget about them because for them, it's not the art itself. It could be anything that gives them some value. But the other type of a real art collector, that's a special breed. They are the ones who are wanting to own it and they are the ones who are driving the price of um, the item so high that there are all these thieves that are willing to steal it. So what is the psychology of an, of an art collector? So again, I have to go back to evolutionary psychology. And by the way, this has been noticed for as long ago as Roman period when there is this statement about one person who was collecting art, it says, and I'm going to read it, an ostentatious desire to seem persons of superior taste. So something about owning the art is about superior taste, more refined taste. Of course, it depends on what kind of art. One person may think it's superior taste. Another person may think what kind of junk it is. That's a different issue. But why do people want to own what they love? So one reason in modern psychology, that is again, evolutionary psychology, is that it is to create and strengthen social bonds. So there is this one uh, professor in City University of New York. He has written this essay called Why People Collect. He is a professor of art crime, uh, not he, she, Erin Thompson. So what she says is the entire art collection or art collect, people who collect art, they do it because of creating social bonds and also to communicate some information in their circles. So think about a person you know who's collecting art and exhibiting it. Maybe a big, huge art collector, or maybe people who just buy art because they love it, they think it's beautiful, their homes will look beautiful. But it, it's not just that. There is something beyond that. That is, they're trying to communicate information about them to their circles, something about their taste, something about uh, them being, you know, like having some kind of a social status or some kind of maybe even uh, some power if it's a huge collection. And why is that important? So in evolutionary psychology, they would say this is because people basically want to become attractive for mates. So it goes back to or goes down to or goes with wherever to people wanting to attract partners because they want to spread their genes. And as a result, they're always interested in creating this social status. And social status and power can bring you more mates. And uh, that is the reason why collectors, big, huge collectors would actually go out and collect this art and willing to give any price. So that again goes back to our unconscious. When you see a beautiful object, okay? And if something in your unconscious is getting triggered, you may not even know what exactly that is. You are going to be hijacked by that. And the attraction you feel towards that piece that you want to own, you want to touch, you want to use it, that attraction is very hard to avoid. That temptation is very hard to avoid. You will do almost anything to actually make that acquisition happen. If you can afford it, if not, you may go a little bit beyond your affordability. 
So Paul Getty, Paul Getty was, is uh, Paul Getty Museum is the richest museum in the world. And Paul Getty was a billionaire oil person and who also is one of the best known art collectors. And you know what Paul Getty was? He was the most, he was a very stingy person. He was known for that. For example, outside his villa, he in fact had a public phone, public booth, because he did not want his guests to make long distance phone calls by using his own phone. So that kind of a person, but he paid huge amounts of money to acquire in the beginning Greek and Roman art. So the reason they say that Paul Getty got into collecting art is because he wanted to show the world that he was a cultured European as opposed to just an uncultured American. So he, by the way, he was, he's from Los Angeles. I guess I'm going back to Los Angeles a lot. He's from Los Angeles and some oil person. He made a lot of money when he was 24 and he didn't come from a cultured background. And he tried to prove that about himself for the rest of his life by learning European languages, by visiting Europe, by learning about the art. So there is something about the art that seems like you are communicating something about you that is more refined, that's more tasteful. And that's the reason why people get into collecting art. There is in fact also a interesting book. Those of you who are interested in this subject may want to read it. It's by Eric Kendall. It's by actually, the book is by Eric Kendall who is a Nobel laureate in neuroscience. And he writes about reductionism in the art and brain science. So he was very interested in abstract art. And he writes how brain science, like a scientist uh, who takes away, uh, who, who uh, creates different, who breaks down a complex sub subject into smaller parts to understand it. The same way an artist also looks at a scene and they take away only the important part and they break down that scene and they take the important elements and then they use those elements in expressing whatever it is that they are trying to express. So just the way an artist is supposed to be expressing their thoughts and feelings in their art piece, even a collector is expressing their thoughts and feelings in their collections. Freud was a very known collector that he was so attached to his collection that when he, during Nazi period, when he left to go to London, he made sure his collection went to London. Now, anytime, you know, anybody who's collecting art or if you are collecting art, any, I think you want to think about what communication they are doing with the rest of the world. And for yourself, what is your archetype that's get Okay, so e even art collectors, they always collect specific types of objects. And the way they choose their objects, maybe it depends on their archetypes. So uh, that's about the psychology of an art collector. I don't want to get into too much in deep into this subject because we are running out of time and I, would like to ask you the questions. Okay, so that these are the facts before I ask you the question. Is there, are, are there, okay, before I go on and on, let me see if there is any question or comment, okay? Okay, so Sri Devi is saying, Sri Devi Bhaktula is saying, Monalisa became, I think that's hers, Monalisa became world famous only due to this step. Maybe someone else said it. Sri Devi is saying, I love watching movies where they show elaborate art thefts and this enabling lasers, etc. Art thefts show the actors looking very cool as compared to bank thefts. Oh, Lena is saying that. It's true. And most, and there are 50 plus movies on art theft, and all of them you can see and enjoy. Uh, Nandini is saying, is it ego gratification? Yes, to a certain degree. Yes, it is ego gratification, as in even ego gratification as in something that you're trying to say about you to the world. So the facts are we have realized the value of our own heritage because of Western eyes, because of the value that the West is willing to pay for our artifacts and from their eyes. 
let's admit it they are better equipped to keep them safe and being viewed by the world now some of these things i'm going to say may be somewhat provocative but i want to know what your answer is to that what should we do okay so let me i ask debashi this question and let me go over it really quickly and meanwhile i want you to think about what do you think india should do about the stolen artifacts let it stay in the west or try to get it back yeah so now the question is okay now it's there right now there is this movement the nationalist movement that we need to bring it back right because it's rightfully ours and it shouldn't be there my question is what do you think about that because on one hand if you take away the nationalistic part and the history and all that the fact is that the western museum are preserving it and the whole world is able to look at it and appreciate it but if it comes back to yeah. india it will be in the vaults of asi yeah that's true that that is very true actually it's a very problematic whole thing actually because you know i mean it's the ownership of nations that comes into the picture you know again it's let me see it's the same thing that we were discussing that until you know western colonial powers brought up the idea of the ownership of nations yeah. we didn't care about it but now yeah. we also have to act as if we have to own it as a nation you know <laughs> but but w- w- what you're saying is you see that the norton simon nataraja for example yeah i i kind of i actually personally heard naga swami who was the kind of head of south south indian archaeological survey uh-huh. a very great uh, art historian Mm-hmm. uh he came personally to take it back you know and yes. was there during the case and all that so he was talking about it yeah. so basically he made the case on this basis that here you all are actually putting it up as a art object and people are coming and gawking at it as if it's some kind of beautiful thing but for us it's a temple object and thousands of people see it as a living thing and they yeah. go and worship it and you know we have to get it back for that purpose the problem is that when it came back it never went back to the temple it's yes. like you said it's in the asi godown oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah and uh, but the brihadeshwara natraj at least went back to its temple right but right. but the temple objects is one at least we can say that okay they should the deity should go back to their original uh, uh, residence however yeah. there are these archaeological treasures right so when they go back to india the question is should we take it back what what do you, what do you think is the right way that let me ask you this what do you think we should do at this point given that they have these treasures and we have uh, that's our heritage that's our culture yeah i think you know i mean we can't run away from the fact that we are into the age of nations and that there is something called national property and you know if we, if we if we accept the fact that the world is full of nations we have to own up and say that you know these are our national property i personally don't think we should go after everybody and try to bring back what whatever has gone out but i think you know the whole notion of national property is today valid and you know that's why they have created these walls and said that national property what has been classified as national art should not go out of the nation now yeah. and if it does go out of the nation it's considered to be theft and it should be it should be brought back and i agree with you that you know they have not done the best thing by it you know in many cases but that's an internal problem i think national property that has gone out ought to be brought back and treated with respect that's what you think how about how about this notion of sharing that you know the western museums that have that are acknowledge that this came from this country uh, from this period they acknowledge that yeah okay probably the papers we have are forged that this was stolen but then they share it with india so they uh, can keep it for certain number of years and then it comes back to india and india can loan it to them that's possible that's perfectly good that's a perfectly good and you know all objects circulate they go from okay so basically what uh, 
I, I am proposing is a sharing idea. It's not my original idea. However, I really like the idea of uh, back and forth sharing where Western museums loan, I mean, uh, take it from us on loan after acknowledging and somebody's saying, okay, so um, Lena says that it should come back because it's rightfully ours. Shirley is saying something similar. Every time I see British Museum, I want them to return all those goods. And hey, they make money out of exhibiting it and they don't feel guilty about it. They should return it back. And Madhu is saying that Indian government can have a museum of solar. Aha, Madhu is saying what I was going to propose. Madhu, you stole my idea, uh, but it's okay. It is about stolen art and stolen ideas. So, uh, Okay, so now let's see what a financial economist is saying Indian government should do about this art, okay? This is a financial economist and a one who wants to provoke, I believe. So let's see what he is saying. This is Professor Bhagwan Chaudhary from UCLA and now at ISB. Let's see. There is this question of art stolen from countries like India that has shown up in places like the British Museum. And there is a call now to return that art back to India. The question is, is that right? Is that fair? How would an economist look at this issue? So one could argue that were it not for the British, had they not taken that art away from India and other places, maybe it would have survived. And even if it had survived, maybe it would not have the same value that it does now. So how to think about whether or not this art should be returned? And I think my answer is, yes, at a price, it should happen. So let's take a simple example. Suppose there is a piece of art that was worth $10 million if it were not taken outside India. Okay? And let's suppose there's only a 50% chance that it would have survived all these years. So in some sense, the average value of that art, had it not been taken out of India, is only $5 million. Now let's assume that the piece of art that's sitting in the British Museum is currently valued at 20 million. So my answer would be that yes, if the art is given back to India, India should pay the increase in value from 5 to 20, 15 million to get it back. Alternatively, the British should pay India $5 million to keep the art in the British Museum. In other words, India should have the right to get it back, but they should pay a price for making sure that that art was kept well and in fact, it increased in value. I think that is the only fair, economically fair answer. <laughs> what do you guys think? <laughs> I think I think people are going to be mad at you, Bhagwan, for suggesting that Chor Bazaar uh, say you know like you can you can buy it back from the same Chor after paying them for keeping it well and good. Ajit is saying, will the Brits be willing to give up their art? And the answer is no, they are not. Canadians have, Australians have, Germans have but not the British, USAians have. I call Americans USAians. Um, and Ajit is also, will it also apply to the private? Will it be only, if it is sharing, will it be only one way sharing? Um, one way, no, it will be two way, but um, Indians may not be uh, able to pay for the journey of the art from the West to here. So in that sense, it may, be, may have to be one way. And uh, someone else is saying, Anuradha, Anirudh, Anir, uh, Anirudh Jalan is saying, my view is that physical location of art is no, no longer relevant because of digital world, like what we are experiencing. That's also a great idea. 
but you know there's something about owning viewing touching or at least touching not like with your own hands but with your naked eyes says something about a brain that's still not adjusted to the digital world i think i don't know how it is for you guys to see this particular presentation ajit is saying bhagwan is totally ridiculous <laughs> okay so lena is saying how much will britain britain pay for for uh, colonizing us wow i think lena you need to ask shashi tharoor that question um so given that i think i'm going to be ending my presentation and um all of you who have given their views will get a special surprise gift from me and uh, that gift is that of gratitude and appreciation <laughs> that is the gift and it's been very interesting to find out a lot about this kind of subject and bhagwan surely saying that you should be fair and believe that it would have been safe in our own country mm, surely yeah maybe maybe yes maybe not i don't know about that so there are two sides to this story it's a double edged sword and with that i would like to uh, end my presentation and thank you very much and uh, fozia i think i will end it i don't think you need to uh, say the final words nandini is saying the ethical thing would be to give ownership to the right owner i guess at this point i'm so tempted to look at other comments but i think i'm going to say namaste thank you dhanyawad shukriya and uh, see you again uh, on may 5 i'll be talking about mindfulness and that's really my subject so i hope to see you all there thank you thank you all <laughs>